Hi, I'm David. Welcome back to the Outdoor Education Center's ongoing video series about what's happening in the natural world. This week, we're going to be addressing some of the changes that you may be noticing around you right now. You'll notice that we refer to a lot of earlier videos that we made, where we looked at what we generally think of as the beginning of the year, that spring season, when young animals are born and when new growth is occurring all around us. So we're going to revisit a lot of those same topics and see where things are now, what's come of these animals, and how have those new plants that started growing then, how have they changed and developed over time. September 22nd marks the autumnal equinox. Now, six months ago, exactly, I mentioned this idea of an equinox. And what that means, basically, is that we're going to have equal lengths of daylight and darkness here. So, 12 hours of each. And it has to do with the, the position of the Earth and, and the Sun, but it is usually considered to be the official start of, of fall. For those of us here in the Northern Hemisphere, that means that every day between now and December 22nd, we'll have a little less daylight. And we'll start to notice that. It seems like it gets dark earlier. It's going to also start to get colder days. We're going to have weather that responds to this decrease in daylight. So we're going to start to notice some changes. And you may have already realized that you need to go out and put a long sleeve shirt on or wear a jacket now. You might have heard geese honking and already moving heading somewhere other than Ottawa. Maybe you've even seen some creatures gathering food or trying to bury it in places near where you live. So there are a lot of changes going on as the seasons change and all of these organisms around us are doing what they need to do to survive. So this week we're going to dive into some of these different changes that we're observing in our natural world, share them with you, and ask you to go out and look around and do the same. I'm here at McSkimming's Apple Orchard to talk a little bit about some of the changes that coyotes and fox are doing in order to prepare for winter. Now, in the fall, sometimes the young pups, the males, are learning how to hunt. So are the females. But some of the males will oftentimes leave their mom and dad and go and find their own territory for the winter time. Sometimes the female pups will stay as a family unit, learning how to hunt, protecting the territories, and then will even help raise some of the pups come spring. So they'll sometimes stay together. Now, in order to get ready for winter though, whether they're pups or adults, the coyotes are really quite smart creatures. We all think of them as carnivores, meat eaters, right? They like to eat rodents and we often see fur in their scat, like this evidence that we found actually as we came to the apple orchard today was some of this scat with some fur in it from rodents. So this is coyote scat, which is really cool and a little bit um, interesting as to why we're finding it here in an apple orchard. Well, Coyotes are actually what we might want to call local vores, or they're also opportunistic feeders, especially in the fall. Because just like you and I might like these apples, they're so delicious this time of year. And all around me on the ground here are apples that have fallen from the tree and are on the ground. Now, take a look at this scat that we found. Do you notice it almost looks like apple peels in that scat? Well, that's exactly what it is. All the apples that have fallen on the ground, the coyotes and fox and bear will all come and eat these fruits because as good as they are for us, they have fallen for those animals to eat. These trees don't just feed us and help us prepare for winter, but the animals as well. So coyote and fox, they'll eat those rodents, but they'll eat fruits, as well as nuts and seeds, because all of these give them protein and sugars uh, and everything that they need in order to build healthy muscles, put on a layer of fat, and help their fur grow nice and thick so that they can stay warm in the winter. Something else that both the coyote and the fox will do in the winter is they don't often sleep in a den, especially fox. 
sometimes you could find them just burrowed underneath the snow. And if any of you have dogs, do they ever curl up into a ball and then tuck their tails around their noses? Well, that's what coyote and fox do in order to stay warm in the winter. They have that thick fur underneath and then that nice warm tail to keep them a little bit warmer. So if you're out apple picking at all this fall, take a look at the ground. The ones that are on the ground, they're not necessarily garbage. They could be food for the animals that might pass through. Mm, so good. In the spring, we looked at squirrels and their babies. Squirrels will have their babies in the spring, but now they've had the whole summer to grow up. So they look like this. I'm noticing in my neighborhood at this time of year, many of the pine trees and oak trees and beech trees have started to set nuts and those nuts and cones have started to drop onto the ground. And that means the squirrels are starting to get busy collecting those nuts. They can tell according to the available daylight hours that it's going to be winter soon. And you may have noticed that our daylight hours have started to shrink as well. So they are starting to gather up all of the cones and nuts and store them for the colder days when all of their food sources are going to be covered with snow. And squirrels will gather all of this food and they'll store it in a couple of different ways. Red squirrels will store their food in a cache. A cache is when something is hidden or stored somewhere. This old tree stump at McSkimming has been used as a cache for many years. The red squirrels store all of their cones and nuts inside. And they'll come back to it later in the winter. Other squirrels might store their food in different ways. So the gray squirrel will store their food using a strategy called scatter hoarding. So they'll scatter their food in different spots all around the forest or all around the neighborhood. And then they have a few different spots that they can come back to in order to get their food for winter. I wonder how long it takes them to gather all of the food that they're going to need to make it through the cold winter months. Have you noticed squirrels moving around in your neighborhood? I encourage you to observe to see what are they doing right now. Along with the changes that are happening in fall, uh, many of the plants and animals, of course, are preparing for winter. And so, just like we saw in spring when we had the arrival of many birds from down south who had spent their winter uh, in warmer places, Fall is a really great time to be observing a bunch of species that are headed back down south to warmer climates where there will be more food uh, and warmer temperatures throughout the next couple months than there would be here in Ottawa or across many of the parts of Canada. There is one bird that I have been watching all summer long and that is the ruby-throated hummingbird. We only have this one species that visits us here in Ontario each summer and they typically find their mate, uh, lay eggs and raise their young here in Ontario and then they will head south in the fall for their winter months. The last hummingbird that I had coming to my hummingbird feeder at my house uh, visited around the 20th of September and I haven't seen a hummingbird since which makes me think that they have moved on their way and are moving to warmer places down south. This could be anywhere in the lower states or they may make an impressive flight, um, one without stops, across the Gulf of Mexico all the way to Mexico or Central America to spend the winter. So that flight for one of the smallest birds in the world uh, can be anywhere from 18 to 20 hours of non-stop flying to get from one shore to the other. One other thing that impressed me about this tiny beautiful bird is that they often will not fly south or make this migration in flocks. They will 
make these trips solo often and so that means that young uh, hummingbirds that hatched here in Ontario have to make their way to Mexico even though they've never been there before and so I find it incredibly amazing that even though they have never made this trip they can somehow find their way when we think of some of the smallest creatures out there that migrate the hummingbird really blows me away but so does the monarch butterfly another species that spends its time in Ontario it's an insect and yet it is able to make its way all the way from Ontario to Mexico and that's where it will spend the winter. Now one of the most impressive things about this I think is that um, when monarch butterflies come into Ontario in early spring to lay their eggs uh, there's been multiple generations of monarch butterfly who are making their way from Mexico. It's not the same butterfly that leaves Mexico that arrives here in Ontario. It might be the great great grandchildren of that butterfly from Mexico. And a monarch butterfly has a lifespan of maybe a month and in that time it will lay its eggs and it will, um, it will pass away and its, its offspring will then do that same thing. Um, until we get to around August and maybe early September. And the monarch butterflies that emerge from their chrysalis at that point they don't have any interest in uh, finding a mate and laying eggs. Their goal is to get enough food so that they can make this journey to Mexico, over 3,000 kilometers. And they will fly across um, big bodies of water, such as the Great Lakes, and make their journey all the way to the western um, mountains and there's forests where they're going to roost for the winter. And they might have a lifespan, this last sort of generation of monarchs, uh, might have a, la a lifespan of anywhere from six to eight months long. Can you imagine though, um, kind of emerging from a chrysalis and making a trip that far all the way to Mexico and never having done it before with no sort of guide or map to help you. So it really is impressive to think that these creatures are able to make it there where they can spend the winter safely and then start that cycle again to move north in the spring. Flowers like the one you see here behind me are really, really important in uh, helping monarch butterflies prepare for the winter. We have a couple different fall flowers such as goldenrod and asters that uh, provide a nutrient rich nectar for the butterflies to help them fatten up and get them ready for this long journey south. Monarch butterflies and hummingbirds are two of the many species that will migrate south uh, in the coming weeks and have already been flying south. Now waterways like this one, I'm standing at the McSkimming waterfront right now along the Ottawa River. Um, these places provide incredible stopover points and migration pathways for many of the migrating species, especially many of the birds. Some of you might live close to the Ottawa River and have access to viewing points where you can look for some of these migrating species that are coming from far up north and gathering and making their way down south. But just remember that the Ottawa River isn't the only place uh, here in this area where you can find these migrating species. You're able to watch them and observe them from your backyards, um, from your street, maybe while you're waiting for a bus, even in downtown. Local parks, ponds and wetlands are also really great places to see some of these animals stopping over on their way down south. I want to encourage you in the coming weeks to be paying attention to the local species in your area. Which species are missing? Which animals that were here all summer are you noticing aren't really around anymore? What species have arrived or come to this area that maybe you haven't seen before? And what species do you think still have yet to leave? Some may have left in late August and early September and some may not leave until uh, early October or even into November. Now that we've learned about some of the changes that are beginning as we welcome in a new season, it's your turn to head outside to your schoolyard, your local green space, even your backyard, and to sit, look, and listen to observe some of those changes. You're going to take your nature journal with you and you're going to have a chance to record all of your observations. You'll notice on this example here that I have 
chosen to observe the pile of oak leaves and acorns that I was finding along my street. So I picked one of the oak leaves and some of the acorns to sketch and I've written down some of my observations by saying I notice, some of my curiosities by saying I wonder, and then making some connections by using the phrase it reminds me of. Remember you can use words, pictures, and numbers to record your observations. Hopefully some of what we've learned about today and some of the observations that you go out and make on your own are going to spark some questions with inside of you. So that I wonder statement. There's many ways that we can find answers to our curiosities or our questions. Let's take a look at some of our favorite ways to find answers to our questions. I really enjoy going to my school or public library and looking for books on the topics that I'm wondering about. Sometimes you can get picture books or bigger chapter books or even really heavy books called encyclopedias. They're really great ways to be able to flip the pages and read about what it is that you're wondering about. Often I find myself wondering about something that's going to occur next in nature. And for me, the easiest way to answer those questions is to make an experiment out of it or just repeatedly visit the same place and watch over time how things change. For instance, if I see a plant and I wonder what kind of flower is that plant going to grow? Then I can come back to it and document it and I can discover for myself what the flower is like. And that takes some time, but when you're trying to better understand the natural world, often putting in the time is the, is the best way to get that information in here. Sometimes I wonder so many things that I can't answer all of my questions. And that's okay too. You might have many, many questions that you can't answer them all. So sometimes I just have to leave my questions unanswered. And often I uh, might find an answer at a later time when I'm out exploring. You can use an app called iNaturalist that can be downloaded onto phones or iPads. And if you're under the age of 18, you will need an adult or a teacher to help you out with using this app, but it can help you to identify things if you're wondering what kind of tree this is or what insect it is that you just saw on that leaf. Thank you so much everybody for joining us as we head out this autumn and explore some of the changes that are starting to happen in our local spaces. We hope that if you have a journal entry or maybe you found some answers to some of your questions that you'll share those with us. Thanks again and we look forward to seeing you next time.